I want to be careful my wording here, not to be overly dramatic, but I was upset by it. I just got back from seeing The Unfriend at the Criterion Theatre in Piccadilly Circus here in London's West End. And it's the first straight play pure comedy that I've seen in ages. I've seen some comedy stuff. I've seen some really, really fun improv. Saw Ostentatious, did a review on that. Thought that was really great. And for example, saw uh, Midsummer Night's Dream at the Globe last year, which was just breathtaking. And by breathtaking, I mean I expelled all of my breath because I was just cackling the entire time. Seriously, that production was so damn good. But I mean, that's Shakespeare. And this was very much not. This is a comedy that was written by Stephen Moffat. It's directed by Mark Gatiss. And it's got some cast members from TV who you might recognize, such as Reese Shearsmith, who plays the sort of main character, a dad called Peter. Amanda Abington, who you might recognize from Sherlock, potentially. She plays the mum of the family called Debbie. And just sort of to give you some context, basically these two, go on holiday, meet this woman called Elsa, who's played by Frances Barber, and Elsa then sort of invites herself over to their home, where she stays for a few days, meets their kids, and causes some trouble because they find out that Elsa is actually a murderer. So it's this whole thing of how do we get her out of our house, but we're British, so we have to be overly polite about this, and we don't want to just say it to her face, because then also, what if she murders us? So that's the kind of comedic setting of the play. Now, in terms of performances, I really really loved Reese Shearsmith. I thought he did so damn well. His physical comedy and the way that he would present a joke in a scene even before he would say a joke necessarily or deliver a line was so good. It was the highlight of the show for me beyond anything else. I thought Reese was just stunning. And I also really, really loved the set. It was quite for Privet Drive in its kind of layout. There was a staircase at the back leading up that you could run up and down, or I couldn't, but the characters could. And that led to this sort of forced perspective, projected view of what was the outside of the house. I'll have that on screen here so you can see what I'm talking about. But then obviously the main bulk of the set was the downstairs, which extended towards the audience. And so it felt like you were sort of seeing a cutaway of the house, but done in a very minimal way in terms of actual staging and set design. But what they did do was super effective. And the interior of the house looked as you might expect. There was kind of a kitchen area, a settee, stuff like that and lots of kind of knickknacks around. But it just looked really homey and really cozy and comfortable. And I thought it was perfect. Now, something happened at the beginning of this show that I was really, and I'm, I want to be careful my wording here, not to be overly dramatic, but I was upset by it. And I wasn't upset in the sense of, wow, this has offended me. Okay, but I was upset because a choice was made that meant that for the rest of the play, I felt like I couldn't really tap in to the humor and the comedy of the situation in the way that I should have been able to because of that thing that had happened at the beginning. So I want to dive into that now and kind of explore that a bit as the focus of this review because everyone else that was in the building watching The Unfriend that day seemed to have a jolly good time. There was a lot of laughing happening and overall the audience that were there that were definitely skewed older more than I see in musical theatre audiences, for instance, they seemed to think that everything was a real hoot and it all went down really well. But for me, I sort of had this almost out of body experience where I was sitting there going, I I'm just not enjoying this the way these other people are. And I think it's because I've been kicked out of the experience a bit in this opening five minutes. So when the show opens, it's not set in the house. It's set with the two parents meeting Elsa on a cruise. So you've got some deck chairs set up and there's more forced perspective just to make it look like you're on a ship, even though it's very much just the sort of front meter or so of the stage. And initially you have some dialogue about like Trump, for instance, and about the fact that the dad always feels like he needs to be a bit agitated and like reading Twitter just makes him agitated. And so he loves doing it sort of thing. And there's some funny stuff there. But then Elsa, this quite unusual lady, is kind of spotlighted and highlighted as the focus of the conversation for a little bit. And she starts talking about this person. And I can't remember if it was the person specifically, Barnaby, or one of Barnaby's relatives, but she basically makes five fat jokes in a row about 
whoever this person was. Let's just say it was Barnaby, even if it was like Barnaby's sister or something. So the first fat joke lands and it's something like, oh yeah, she looked like a uh, beach ball with lips or something. And everyone's like, ah, that's a real funny one. And then she just did another one. 10 seconds later, and everyone was like, we're really just having a great time here. And she's describing how like they're sort of this formless person and their fatness is so overwhelming and so sort of hilarious. And everyone in the audience was eating it up. And I am not someone who always, oh, how to word this? Cause it's weird territory to be discussing here. I don't always agree with the commentary that you often see online of how people will say, oh, you're being fat phobic and that's awful. And you should always embrace people of any size and they should be able to be that size and you shouldn't judge them for it. And that's healthy and things like that. And I think there's aspects of that argument that I align with and aspects of it that I don't. But overall, in sort of instances like that, I'd say that I'm, I'm a little bit of a skeptic and I try not to be kind of preachy with the way that I view things. So it's unlikely that I'm going to jump onto like a TikTok comment section and start being like, this is awful. Like you shouldn't be like criticizing someone for being fat or vice versa. Like this is awful. There's so much like fatness here that's being idolized or something. And that's bad. Like I'm not going to take a side in that regard, really. But in this case, for whatever reason, these repeated fat jokes just felt gratuitous and just started to feel mean. Again, I'm not someone that is sensitive to this in any other area of my life, really. I don't see myself as some fat person white knight or whatever. But for some reason, in the opening act here, I found myself sitting there going, this is a bit juvenile and just a bit mean-spirited. And I don't really find it that funny. And it was because I'd had that realization in the opening moments of the play that then throughout the rest of the play, it was like the comedian that I was watching had sort of lost my trust. Like, you know, when a room, an audience turns against a comedian on stage and it starts getting really, really difficult for them to get a laugh out of the crowd because the crowd is no longer open to the idea of laughing. Like you could say something absolutely hilarious, but if the crowd doesn't want to engage with it or has written you off already, it's not going to land in the same way. And that's kind of what had happened to me. And so then as the play progressed, there's these jokes, for example, about one of the kids who actually I want to call out as being really great because it was an understudy playing Alex, I believe the character's name was. His name is Barnaby Taylor. I thought that he was very funny, but the character Alex has these jokes about like needing to fart all the time and stuff like that. And then there's some literal toilet humor where this guy's trying to look into the toilet and there's a policeman involved and it's just pure toilet humor throughout. And like, I'm, I'm absolutely not sitting here and being like, I want more highbrow comedy, thank you very much. And this is awful. Like, I don't want to draw that distinction because I very much feel like there is a place for juvenile humor to be really funny. And clearly everyone else in the audience, despite being significantly older on average than I am, they were jumping in and engaging with that juvenile humor and loving it. They were eating it up. But for some reason, for me, once the fat joke stuff had kind of turned my ear a little bit and made me go, really? Is that, is that what we're doing here? From then on, I was kind of analyzing everything else in the play going, is this funny? Or is this more of the thing that I think is a little bit not funny? And it really ruined the whole show for me, sadly. And I think maybe part of the issue too is that I kind of expected more from Stephen Moffat because Stephen Moffat is a great writer. I thought that was the case at least, but he's resorted here a lot of the time to stuff that was just easy instead of stuff that was less easy, I guess, to write and to conjure up, but much more valuable once he'd done so because then it would have been this really kind of sparkling comedy that I just don't think has actually been achieved, unfortunately. It's, it's a tough one. I do not want by any means for the kind of takeaway that you take from this video to be... I'm a stuck up asshole that can't get over a fart joke or something because that's not the case. But I think there's a deeper conversation here to be had. And I was actually talking to someone that I met at a YouTube event the other day called Rowan Ellis. And she told me a bunch of super interesting stuff about how she'd experimented in this sort of area a little bit in her studies because in her studies, she would examine how different pieces of theater 
prime an audience to expect to engage in a certain way. And so you maybe go to a punch drunk, for instance, and you're expecting there to be audience interaction in that case. Or you maybe go to the Globe and maybe in an opening scene of something at the Globe, there's something that kind of rouses that uh, reveler kind of almost heckling, but not heckling, just sort of murmuring and presence sentiment that you don't really get anywhere else because you have people literally in the pit of the theater standing there who, as they would have done in Shakespeare's time, are milled through by performers in the show and they're kind of involved but not fully involved. Or you've got shows like The Bodyguard in Manchester that has just had the issue where they've not invited the audience to partake. They've actually told them not to. It says, please don't sing on a sign. And yet they've had issues with audience members actually singing along out loud during the show. Chaos. So you've got different approaches to this across the board, but in all instances, what's happening there is a creative on the team has said, how do we convey to the audience member, perhaps before they've even sat in their seat, maybe it's just when they walk in the door or even when they're queuing outside, how do we convey to them the nature of the experience that they're about to receive, that they're about to be shown, and how should they best interact with it? How should that viewer set their expectations such that they are met when the thing happens and there's no dissonance there because that's what i experienced i experienced dissonance between my expectation and what was delivered what was delivered being a little bit crass and unfunny to me in a way that i maybe would have had more patience for if it was later in the show potentially when i kind of settled in or if it had some kind of payoff that wasn't purely their fat and that's the joke. It's something I see in other media too and I think is essential and often overlooked, this idea of audience expectation management and how you as a creative, as someone making art, would really benefit from putting some energy into kind of crafting that experience instead of letting that happen. Like if it's not deliberate, if you just write the jokes and then hope that they all land well in whatever order you've written them, then I think you're maybe risking or opening the floor to scenarios like this one where 95% of the audience might have been having a great time, 99% might have been having a great time even, but 1% are sitting there going, that's not very nice. And I just can't really get behind this now for the remaining two hours or so. It's not that I want there to be like a disclaimer at the beginning. It's not that I wish there'd been like a trigger warning, God forbid. I'm not making that case. I'm just trying to kind of dig in a little bit here to something that in the moment was very minor for me. And I recognize I was probably the only person having that experience in the audience, but that I think is actually representative of maybe a bigger topic that could be worth some discussion. There was certainly some funny stuff in The Unfriend and some moments that I did laugh, but I did find myself a little more detached from the entire thing than I would have liked. And hopefully you found it interesting, me kind of trying to dig into why that was the case. I'll see you next time and subscribe if you haven't already. Bye for now.